Hi there. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Tom Weaver, and I'm the editor of AA Files. And this is the um, second in our series of AA Files lectures. Uh, following George Tesso's lecture here last autumn, this evening I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Mary Beard back to the AA. Uh, Mary is Professor of Classics at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of Newnham College. She's the Classics Editor of the Times Literary Supplement and writes a regular blog for the Times Online called A Don's Life. She's also the author of a number of books on aspects of classical culture, including most recently her book on the Roman Triumph, as well as her earlier work on the classic scholar Jane Ellen Harrison, and two really terrific studies, biographies almost, of the Parthenon and the Colosseum. The Parthenon book begins with an account of when Freud finally visited the Parthenon in 1904, he was surprised to find that it actually existed. In many ways, this story acts as a kind of parable for all of Mary's scholarship, but the focus of her work is the power of ideas as much as the physical reality of certain structures, and that the residual traces of ancient Greece and Rome resonate as modern phenomena as much as they do as antique ruins. In the process, Mary shatters certain illusions we might have had of classics as a subject, that it isn't, as she describes it herself, just for upper-class toffs, but is actually more democratic and more accessible. She also dismantles certain long-held myths about ancient Rome, filtered down to us through the, through the fictionalized and celluloid ancients played by Russell Crowe, Frankie Howard, Kenneth Williams, and in figures like Asterix and Spartacus. The Romans, she's commented, didn't actually wear togas all that often, and that the most threatening animals in the Colosseum were typically sheep. She has, at various times, been described as a dangerous don and the most intelligent woman in England. The testimonial on the back of her most recent book says that she plays havoc with convention. And similarly, reviewers often talk of the wickedness of her writing. But this danger and chaos is something that is clearly admired. She is iconoclastic, polemical, and always challenging of assumption. She's currently working on a book on jokes and humor in ancient Rome, but her next book is about Pompeii and it is on this subject that she will be talking tonight. So again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary Beard. Um, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, after that introduction, I'm afraid this lecture can only be a disappointment, so, but I'll try. Um, right, let's start with a picture, whoops. That's just to set the scene. I want to start with a quote. I always had an idea that you went down into Pompeii with torches by the way of damp, dark stairways, just as you do into silver mines and traverse gloomy tunnels with lava overhead and something on either hand like dilapidated prisons gouged out of the solid earth that faintly resembled houses. But you do nothing of the kind. Fully one half of the buried city is completely exhumed and thrown open freely to the light of day. And there stand the long rows of solidly built brick houses, just as they stood 1,800 years ago, hot with the flaming sun. And there are the narrow streets and narrower sidewalks, paved with flags of good hard lava, the one deeply rutted with chariot wheels, the other with the passing feet of the Pompeians of bygone centuries. And there are the bake shops, the temples, the halls of justice, the bars, the theatres, all clean scraped and neat, and suggesting nothing of the nature of a silver mine away down in the bowels of the earth. The sun shines as brightly down on old Pompeii today as it did when Christ was born in Bethlehem. And its streets are cleaner a hundred times than ever a Pompeian saw them in her prime. I know whereof I speak. For in the great chief thoroughfares have I not seen with my own eyes how for 200 years at least the pavements were not repaired, how ruts five and even ten inches deep were worn into the thick flagstones by the chariot wheels of generations of swindled taxpayers, and do I not know by these signs that the street commissioners of Pompeii never attended to their business, and that if they never mended the pavements, they never cleaned them? 
And besides, is it not the inborn nature of street commissioners to avoid their duty whenever they get a chance? I wish I knew the name of the last one that held office in Pompeii so that I could give him a blast. I speak with feeling on this subject because I caught my foot in one of those ruts and the sadness that came over me when I saw the first poor skeleton with ashes and lava sticking to it was tempered by the reflection that maybe that party was the street commission. Now, I don't know if you guessed who that was visiting Pompeii, but it was actually Mark Twain writing in the 1860s in the Innocents Abroad of his visit to the city. And as usual, Twain speaks with a strikingly modern voice and captures many of the pleasures and also the puzzlements that tourists to the ancient town still experience. How strange it is, he begins, that the buried city does not actually feel buried. In fact, Pompeii has been exhumed from metres of volcanic debris and the detritus of centuries. But the entrance ways to the site have been so landscaped that most visitors sense no change of level when they cross the threshold from our world to that of the Romans. That's quite unlike the neighbouring city of Herculaneum, which might actually have been in Twain's mind, where the literal descent into antiquity has always been and remains, I think, a powerful uh, impression of the site. And it's an impression, those of you that know the new reconstruction and restoration of the Getty Villa in uh, Malibu, uh, where uh, the Getty Villa, which is modelled on the Villa of Pompeii, the architects have mimicked the idea of a descent, an archaeological descent into uh, the museum. So first of all, he speaks about that puzzlement, the kind of the lack of boundary between our world and theirs. This, by the way, I will take off. I mean, this is just a famous picture by Bulock of the destruction of Pompeii, just to set the scene. I'm not going to talk about it. But then what Twain uh, fixes on is, of course, what many modern visitors fix on, that is, the bodies of Pompeii. How arresting it is for any visitor to make their first encounter with one of those strange Pompeian <coughs> corpses, which are, of course, not corpses at all, and they're certainly not, as Twain had it, poor skeletons with ashes and lava sticking to them. These casts of the people of Pompeii, the dead of Pompeii, were formed by a rather strange and clever process of inversion, which had been invented only a few years before Twain's visit, by taking moulds from the spaces left by the bodies as they decayed within the lava, leaving only a hole of the right shape. They're strange casts which, in a sense, mark the absence of bodily flesh as much of the presence. But mistaken as he was about the actual materiality of these dead people of Pompeii, Tr Twain's response of domesticating and familiarising them, perhaps this was the body of the street commissioner, he says, is one that most modern visitors share. I wonder what this person, whose form I see, actually did. Whereas 18th century travellers, confronted usually by skeletons rather than the casts of the dead, were often prompted predictably enough, to that 18th century melancholic reverie on the transitory nature of human existence when they visited Pompeii. For them, Pompeii was a city very much of the dead. Since the later 19th century, Pompeii has become a city of at least the recently living. The chunky human forms in plaster evoke not only the tragedy of destruction, but also lives interrupted as they were lived. And that's nicely captured in a memorable cinematic moment in Rossellini's movement, movie uh, uh, Journey to Italy, where it is the embrace of a pair of these corpses that reminds Catherine, who she is, played by Ingrid Bergman, um, who was then, but not for much longer, Mrs. Rossellini. Uh, it reminds Catherine by looking at the corpses still embracing. It reminds her of the emptiness of her own partnership by comparison. But Twain also very much hits the spot uh, with his emphasis on the streets of the ancient city. 
But more than anything else, I think, it's the street scene, the stepping stones and the cart ruts, which not only twist modern visitors' ankles like they did Twain's, but also capture modern visitors' imaginations. <coughs> Here it is the sense of immediacy, I think, that did it. The ruts are almost the equivalent of an ancient footprint. It's a rut. The indelible mark of human movement and the passage of carts that once went about their business down these very streets. And when we hop across the stones from pavement to pavement, part of the fun is just as Twain has it, of knowing that we're treading in exactly the same path as thousands of Roman pedestrians before us. What, of course, gets left out of the picture in this cosy linking of them, the ancient Pompeians, and us, the modern tourist or scholar, is the much more inconvenient set of differences between the modern street and these Pompeian thoroughfares. Twain's faux naive complaints about the disrepair, ruts five and even ten inches deep, worn to the flick, thick flagstones by the chariot wheels of generations of swindled taxpayers, that conceals the fact that the function of the Pompeian street was, of course, significantly different from our own. Why, we should ask, were those curbs at Pompeii so high and why were the stepping stones across the street so essential? The answer is that because these streets is that because these streets were not only transport routes for carts and for pedestrians, transport routes, I should say, that the most modern, up-to-date and nerdish archaeologists have concluded were a complex and logical network of one-way streets. Uh, they were also water courses, as anybody who's ever been in Pompeii in a downpour will know. Pompeii was a city, for the most part, without drainage, except for the street. You needed the high pavements and the stepping stones, not just for the sheer pleasure of hopping from one to another, but to keep your feet out of the water, and I'm afraid much, much worse, which from time to time rushed through this very stinking <coughs> and smelly town. Now, in some ways, of course, I've been unfair to Mark Twain uh, in taking him quite as seriously as I have, but I think that part of the point in his faux naive tones, part of that point was actually to expose those easy assimilations we make about the ancient world and our own. Uh, his faux naivety, I think, points up and makes us confront, uh, quite pointedly, our sense that we are like the Pompeians. And it's a technique he uses beautifully elsewhere in the Innocents Abroad when he's <coughs> talking about gladiators. But the rest of this lecture, in a sense, takes off from Twain's satire. And I want to explore not simply the touristic experience of a visit to Pompeii, but the strategies of reconstruction of the ancient city and of life in the ancient city that for the most part are shared between archeological specialists and the average visitor, whatever that is. And I stress shared here because underlying this paper is a strong sense that there is at root very little difference between a popular and an archeological vision of the site. The popular takes on the city can in fact help us expose many of the unspoken assumptions of archaeology more narrowly defined. Now, in thinking about how we choose to re-envision and re-imagine life in Pompeii or any other ancient site, whether it's the Parthenon or Hadrian's Wall, I think we're always dealing with a trade-off between three different factors which are going to come into play this evening. We're trading off in trying to recapture what life was once like in this ancient place between what remains on the ground, the literal remains of antiquity. Second, how what remains has been restored and presented to us. And third, our own historical projections onto the site, whether that is an urge to domestication of the ancient world, to reconstruct it in our own image, or conversely, the urge to make historical actors and people in the ancient world very odd and quite unlike ourselves.
Now, this evening I'm not primarily concerned with the kind of physical reconstruction. I'm most interested, as we'll see, in the different versions of historical imagination that we project onto a site to make sense of it. But it is worth saying that one of the most reassuring untruths of any archaeological site is the implication that it is presented to us as it survives from antiquity. The real truth is that nothing survives standing from the, from the ancient world itself without a good deal of help. Much as we like to think of it, for example, as a, res as a relic of prehistory, even Stonehenge has been quite considerably reassembled. The Parthenon owes its distinctive profile to engineering works in the 1930s, which not only put many of its columns back in place, but also inserted the iron clamps, which mean they've had to be taken down again. But Pompeii itself has been very heavily worked on in the last 250 years since it was excavated, and it has been much more heavily treated and rebuilt than most people usually recognise, whether that's the casual visitor or the archaeologist. I'm going to give you just two examples of that. Uh, second only, I think, to the eruption of Vesuvius, the biggest damage that Pompeii has ever suffered was a major campaign of Allied bombing in 1943, whose strategic purpose, I have to say, completely baffles me. This destruction and the subsequent rebuild <coughs> that went on throughout the site is almost never referred to in tourist literature, just as it is almost never referred to in archaeological literature either. But this campaign of bombing destroyed many sites in the town. There was a blitz on Pompeii like there was on London. What you see here is a 1943 photograph of the main entrance to Pompeii, which was damaged, not actually irrevocably damaged, but <coughs> quite seriously hit. That's what it looked like in 1943. That's what it looks like nicely rebuilt today. Much of the Pompeian archaeological work of the late 40s and early 50s was, in fact, rebuilding what the bombers had bombed. And I think that's it's interesting because that never that is never something that we are asked to think about as part of the history of the site. But it's not simply a question of bomb damage. What you see on this nice little postcard here uh, is something is one of the most familiar images of Pompeii. It's one of the most famous survivals. Uh, these are paintings taken. Uh, um, I mean, I chose the postcard because. Every image I found of this room had absolutely ghastly colour on it, so I thought it was better to go for a postcard with ghastly colour on than pretend the photograph was, uh, was anything realistic. What you see here is the paintings taken from the most famous room in Pompeii, the luscious red room from the so-called Villa of the Mysteries, which now makes a tremendous impact <coughs> on visitors. Uh, not only because, as you can see here, of the intriguing weirdness of its subject matter. You know, everybody really wonders exactly what kind of whipping flagellation is going on at the top. Um, um, right, this one, this winged figure here is whipping this lady down here, amongst other things. It's not only the intriguing weirdness of the subject matter, but it's also because if you visit this place, it's also the kind of complete visual sense around that these paintings give you with their luscious red. Uh, it's kind of, it's a sort of visual assault on the senses. Uh, you walk into this room and you are part of these extraordinary life-size figures, or at least you were until a barrier was put in place, which I'm afraid now stops any normal visitor actually walking into the room, and they have to admire it only from one end. But it's become, uh, as uh, you can see from this card, one of the most famous replicated images of the city. Uh, and it's one that makes you feel, makes people feel that they really are stepping back into the world of the ancients. The fact is that this is not a miraculous preservation at all, but it is the product of quite aggressive restoration after its discovery in April 1909. Now, to be fair, what you see now is probably not, doesn't give you a misleading impression, totally misleading impression of the original. 
But when these paintings were discovered, they were not in the perfect state we now see them. They were dug up, in fact, out of the ground in a private enterprise dig uh, by the local hotel keeper um, with not much, I mean, sorry, it's, it always sounds naff to kind of criticise early 20th century archaeology, but it wasn't done terribly well. And they were further damaged in all kinds of ways by the strategies of conservation that followed. In the months after the discovery, there was no protection of these images. They were completely exposed to the elements apart from a few hanging cloths which did nothing to prevent them being damaged in an earthquake in June 1909, a couple of months after they were discovered. They also terribly, terribly suffered from rising damp. Uh, from the moment they were exposed to the air, salts rose from the ground and leached through the paintings, leaving horrible, nasty white blotches all over them. So in order to uh, prevent that, because it was already seen that these were going to be charismatic, money-making images, only days after the discovery, they started removing the white blotches with a mixture of wax and petrol, which was repeatedly <coughs> applied to the surface. And by and large, it's that waxing, which has gone on more or less ever since, which accounts for the extraordinary sheen these <coughs> paintings have uh, when you now go and see them. It's possible that they were waxed in antiquity, but what we see is entirely modern restoration. And a recent kind of excavation of these paintings themselves have found that, in fact, the background, if you go back beyond the wax and petroleum, uh, you find a much lighter red colour than what um, we see now. More radically, and uh, to be fair, this was standard practice at the time and by and large remains so, uh, vast stretches of the original walls on which these paintings stood were demolished um, again in the months after their discovery, and they were replaced with damp-proof versions to try rather unsuccessfully to get rid of these nasty white blotches. The paintings were detached and then put back onto the new walls, all of which had happened before, uh, in the autumn of 1909, a German team arrived to restore them and to return them to their ancient state. So what you see now is the product of massive restoration work not actually what you step back into in, kind of in, in an ancient way. And strikingly, that story that I've just given you has been actually unknown or unrecognised even to those people who have written about the themes and style of these paintings until someone had a very bright idea to look carefully at their recent history and published those basic conclusions only last year. The message that they give you, both the bomb damage and the restoration of the, the, the mysteries paintings, is that the ruins you see at Pompeii bear a much more complex and a much more mediated relationship to ancient materiality than you would ever know or guess at first sight. So what we see on the site isn't <coughs> what there was. It's already a complex historical set of reconstructed ruins. But for the rest of this lecture, um, I don't want to talk particularly about how sites have been, how bits of Pompeii have been physically uh, uh, reconstructed. I want to talk about different forms of projection of life and of lifestyle and ideology onto the ruins. Or to put it more simply, I want to focus on how, in our mind's eye, we choose to repopulate the ancient city of Pompeii how we decide what any of these ruined buildings were for, or how we decide simply what to call them. I'm largely going to be looking backwards to the debates and discussions and accounts of the 19th century, where um, distant as they are, and in some senses precisely because they're distant, uh, we, we can see very clearly, it's very obvious to us, the way the assumptions about ancient life are foisted onto and are in turn legitimated by the remains. But that focus on the 19th century isn't meant to suggest that while our predecessors were the victims of their own preconceptions, we, on the other hand, have got Pompeii objectively right. As I shall try and hint so towards the end of this talk, 
looking at past interpretations of life in the ancient town actually tends to act to expose the fragility of our own interpretations. And in many ways, that exposure of our preconceptions by this slightly backdoor route is what this talk is about. <coughs> I'm going to focus on two classic buildings of Pompeii. One was a celebrity spot in the 19th century, but is now not much visited, or people walk past it, but they don't, there's not much to see there. The other is a long-standing highlight of the site and has been since it was first discovered. The first building is a public building, though what sort of public building it was and what it was actually for is part of the question. The second is a private house and one which through fiction and later film became the symbol of luxury and refinement which is often thought to characterise the houses of Pompeii in the modern, modern imagination. Now, our first port of call, then, or the first of these two buildings, is the Forum of Pompeii. And the building I'm going to talk about was discovered in the 1820s. And let me use a pointer. That one in the top right hand corner is a large brown square. Now, what we've got to remember, and I think it's usually forgotten in, what, in how we look at Pompeii, is that not only did Pompeii give the world its first glimpse of Roman domestic life, of what houses were like on the inside, what a Roman house was like as it was lived in, it also gave the modern world, more or less, its first glimpse of a Roman forum. It's true that individual monuments within the Forum of Rome were visible when the Forum of Pompeii was excavated in the 1820s. But basically, the Forum of Rome at that point was still a field, and it was not systematically uncovered till the 1870s. It was at Pompeii that you could first see a complete Roman civic centre, and that made it tremendously attractive for the visitor as all kinds of hints in travellers' accounts of the early 19th century suggest. It was, for example, sitting on the platform of the Temple of Jupiter, which is the temple you can see at the top end, uh, upper left of the picture of the Forum. He was sitting on the platform of the Temple of Jupiter, surveying the Forum in front of him, that Shelley chose to have his picnic when he visited Pompeii in 1818. Now, the sheer novelty of the excavated forum at Pompeii in the 19th century was a really formidable challenge to its interpretation, and it remained so throughout the century. Students <coughs> of Pompeii and visitors were confronted in the Pompeian forum with a range of clearly public buildings, but not more than a few fleeting hints in Vitruvius about what was usually found in a forum to help them identify what they were for. And one of the particular puzzles was that building in the top, looking from here, the top right-hand corner of the forum, which had also become very quickly a highlight of a visit to Pompeii because of its stunning decoration. Oops, there it is. I'll get on to the stunning decoration in a minute because it's in a sadly dilapidated state now. Do not go to this building to see stunning decoration because there is nothing left. But that's what it used to look like. <laughs> it took the form um, of a central courtyard. That's what you can see there. Central courtyard with 12 stone bases in a circle around its centre. Some kind of platform at one end. And these lovely paintings. There were rooms also of various sizes and descriptions around the edge of the courtyard, as well as that strange circular thing in the middle. And 19th century enthusiasm for the building is nicely conveyed by an English lady, Anna Jameson, who saw it at the time of his excavation in March 1822. This is what she said. The most interesting thing I saw, in fact the only thing, for which paintings and descriptions had not previously prepared me, was a building which had been excavated within the last fortnight. The paintings on the walls, 
are the finest which have yet been, been discovered. They are exquisitely and tastefully designed, and though executed merely for effect, the effect is beautiful. I remarked one female figure uh, in the act of entering a half-open door. She is represented with pencils and a palette of colours in her hand. Now, this is the female figure, and Jameson has misread her. She's a figure carrying a sacrificial bowl, but for, for many visitors to Pompeii, she was a female painter in the act, in a wisely self-referential way, in the act of painting. She's got a palette of colours in her hand similar to those that artists now use. And Jameson spent a long time looking at the paintings which had just come up in this building. And in the course of this reverie, she was interrupted by a boy who did one of those famous Pompeian tricks by staging a fake excavation of yet more wall paintings in front of her very eyes. Jameson also writes that antiquarians have not yet pronounced on the name and design of this building. In fact, what we now know is that antiquarians were to have a good deal of trouble in making their minds up what this lusciously painted building was. And through the middle years of the 19th century, a whole series of very closely observed solutions to the function of this building were proposed. Each of them facing very much the same interpretative problems. The first question was what were those 12 bases around the circle in the middle meant for? Were they intended for statues or were they intended to support a lightweight structure in the centre of the courtyard? How were the apparently sacred features, or at least the raised shrine-like thing, at the far end, uh, which included a tiny fragment of a statue of the Emperor Augustus, it was thought, how are those sacred features to be related to the rest of the building and its decoration? What were the fully surviving statues that came from that area supposed to be represent? Who were they supposed to represent? And how could you possibly explain the resemblance of this structure to the so-called Temple of Serapis, the Egyptian god Serapis, that had been discovered earlier at Pozzuoli, which everybody knew wasn't a Temple of Serapis at all, but no one quite knew what it was. Was it like this or not? And what was the room at the back for? And were the benches in it for dining, or were they a counter for cutting up and chopping up and distributing sacrificial meat? And what were all the rooms down the side for? And how did you account, most puzzling of all, for all the large number of fish bones found in the central round area? Now, none of those things made sense altogether. And the competing solutions usually were arrived at by stressing one feature over another. If you decided that the 12 bases in the centre of this structure were statue bases, then you usually decided that this must have been a sanctuary of the 12 gods. It must have been a pantheon. And that's, in a mid-19th century painting, exactly what this is called. With some visitors to the structure, uh, you could see the paintings, how they, in a sense, relate to the sides of the courtyard and this funny sort of shrine-like area at the end. If you decided that the statue of Augustus, that had been the first emperor of Rome, uh, was the key find in the building, then you normally decided that this was not a pantheon at all, but that this was a sanctuary for priests of the cult of the deified Augustus, which also neatly uh, solved the problem of what all the rooms were doing down one side, because they were given one to each priest, uh, and it was thought that they distributed sacrificial meat, or alternatively ate together, at one of the rooms in the back. William Gell, the most famous writer of Pompeii in the 19th century, and in fact, in collaboration with J.P. Gandhi, the man who wrote the very first guidebook to the site in English, backed this idea and thought that there was, this was a, a priestly building. But he reminded his readers that feasting was often associated with ancient priesthoods, and he came pretty close 
to turning the whole building into a restaurant. And instead of the priestly rooms down the side, he decided that they were open dining booths, such as you had in an English restaurant in the early 19th century, uh, not priestly quarters or priestly cell. If, of course, you decided that it was the fish bones that were the most important thing about the whole, then the structure became a market uh, or a makellum, with fish being washed and sold in the middle of it, and the room at the back next to the shrine being a butcher's shop. Uh, that, I should say, is by and large, it is the idea that it's a market, is how it is currently marketed to people today who are visiting the site. Uh, but I shall come back to some of the twists in that story in a minute. So you've got all kinds of different versions of it. It's a restaurant, it's a priestly shrine, it's a, it's a sanctuary of the twelve gods, it's a, it's a butcher's shop, um, it's a makella. Now those competing identifications are in many ways quite funny and quirky and Jell's kind of idea that um, a restaurant is really what it is is probably the nicest of all. But they're also quite significant, I think, because it's in the different attempts to work out the function and what you can call this particular building or any particular building that you get some kind of glimpse of competing 19th century versions of what the ancient world was like. I already mentioned that in excavating and studying this forum, 19th century scholars were working out for the first time, or they were reconstructing, in the words of my title, the very nature of what a forum was in an ancient town. Here we can see them thinking in different ways about what civic and communal functions you'd want in this area, right down to Gell's hunch that you couldn't have, effectively, a town square without a cafe. Now, my second and last example uh, also has William Gell as its, one of its main authorities, but this time it's Gell's view on a private house that I'm interested in and the way that those views were conscripted into a famous fictional account of Pompeii. The fiction is Edward Bulwer-Lytton's The Last Days of Pompeii, which is a classic disaster novel and bestseller first published in 1834. I'm sure you're familiar vaguely with the story, but uh, in it, you have a pair of lovers, Glaucus and Ione, who manage to escape from the doomed city with the help of a blind slave girl who's also in love with Glaucus. And conveniently for the plot, she drowns herself so that Glaucus and Ione can go off together. Now, the appeal of the last days of Pompeii in the 19th century, it was one of the biggest book-selling successes of the 19th century was partly the nice and colourful romance between Glaucus and Irony. Partly it was the moral message. It was very frequently given the Sunday school prizes, this book, uh, because it had a moral message pointing up the depravity of the pagan world from which Glaucus and Irony escaped. And they actually went to Athens and converted to Christianity. But partly the uh, appeal was the vivid and carefully researched archaeological backdrop that Bulwer-Lytton had given the place, from the amphitheatres and baths to the forum and the private houses. And in recreating the image of Pompeii, Bulwer-Lytton had drawn very heavily on Gell's original guidebook to Pompeii, and he'd even dedicated the novel to Gell. Now, the house of the hero, Glaucus, was actually based on a house that had recently been excavated, is a sort of reconstruction on the basis of the book, and it's called The House of the Tragic Poet, which is a small and very nicely decorated property that was excavated in Pompeii in 1824, and it was named when it was excavated after one of its wall paintings, which was then believed to depict a tragic poet reciting his work to a group of listeners. It was called, therefore, the House of the Tragic Poet. That scene has now been re-identified as a mythical scene in which Admetus and Alcestis listen to an oracle. Uh, another of those kind of nice, these Pompeian house names also give you nice uh, vista into past interpretations of these buildings. But this house, the House of the Tragic Poet, quickly became famous uh, 
largely, I think, thanks to Thora Lytton's novel, as an ideal vision of what Pompeian domestic life was like. And a few years later, it provided the model for the Pompeian court at the Crystal Palace. You can see there that vast entertainment venue kind of come commercial showcase, um, which Class Museum, which opened at Sydenham in 1854. Um, this, I think, was rather strange afterlife for a house that had been um, overwhelmed by Vesuvius two millennia earlier. Um, but the house of the tragic poet was more or less faithfully reconstructed within the palace, and it first was intended, kind of appropriately enough, given its domestic image, to act as the tea room for visitors to the Crystal Palace. But that was later changed to be a, a more museum area. And in fact, the only visitor who ever took tea in the house of the tragic poet was Queen Victoria. Uh, in France, it was likewise imitated a slightly more socially exclusive milieu, the interior design um, of a mansion where Prince Jerome Napoleon used to uh, dress up in togas with his mates and pretend to be Romans was also modelled on this house, the house of the tragic poet. In some ways, it was the house for, uh, visit for 19th century visitors. And it is in many ways the standard pattern, as we would now see it, of a reasonably rich Pompeian house. There's a, a reconstruction of it. The facade onto the main street is dominated on either side of the front door by a pair of shops. What they sold, we don't know. And between the shops is one of those very typical grand entrances to Pompeian houses, more than 10 foot high, um, fitted, as you can tell from the pivot holes, um, with large wooden double doors. Directly on the other side of the threshold is another modern icon of Pompeii, the famous mosaic image of the dog, which with its teeth bared and ready to pounce, saying, um, well, someone saying for you, Kawe Kanem, beware of the dog. Visitors who stepped over the threshold found themselves in a long corridor. Now, there's a rather feeble plan here, but... Um, found himself in number one of the shops on either side, a very long corridor, uh, which was once brightly painted, though again very little survives. At the end of the corridor, you came into the house proper, arranged around two open courts, the first, the uh, lofty uh, atrium, uh, which was again lavishly decorated, and at its centre you have one of those traditional open roofs uh, open to the skies with a pool of water marked there uh, uh, catching the rainwater and a number of other, again, brightly painted rooms around. Uh, beyond the atrium, uh, going through passage number seven, you come into a garden area uh, with a colonnade around and a further set of rooms, including a kitchen and latrine. Now, a few things about this house puzzled 19th century writers. Uh, in particular, the two rooms at the very front that we think of as shops. Now, as the plan just marks, near the front door, a narrow door from each of the shops opens into that narrow front corridor, suggesting that the shops were, in some sense, an integral part of the house, that at least whatever commercial establishments they were, were at least in part controlled by whoever lived in the house. Well, that at least is the modern view. For the discoverers in the 19th century, in the absence of any obvious fixtures and fittings, despite the wide shop fronts at the, on the street, uh, people had different views. Gell, for example, thought that they were not shops at all, but they were quarters for the slaves to sleep in. And Bulwer Lytton trailed a wonderfully 19th century idea. He suggested that they were for the reception of visitors who neither by rank nor familiarity were entitled to admission into the real inside of the house. So they were kind of um, uh, uh, receiving rooms for the slightly lower orders. But by and large, apart from those shop rooms which they were puzzled about, they had no difficulty, they thought, in understanding the establishment or recreating its ambiance. 
Bull were written for the property explicitly in terms of a 19th century bachelor's residence and therefore suitable for the unmarried Glaucus. The fine paintings in this house, he reckoned, would, and I'm quoting him, scarcely disgrace a Raphael. And overall, he judged it as a model for the house of a single man in Mayfair, not just for its decor, but also for its entertainment facilities. And one of the first scenes in his novel, in fact, features a dinner party hosted by Glaucus in a dining room just off the peristyle, and they're eating a stereotypically Roman banquet. You know, figs, fresh herbs strewed with snow, anchovies and eggs, followed by a tender roast kid swilled down with a nice vintage from Chios. The kid, he explains, had not been the first choice of a meal. I'd hoped, said Glaucus in a melancholy tone, to have procured you some oysters from Britain, but the winds that were so cruel to Caesar have forbidden us the oysters. So you get a very uh, a tame domestic image of a 19th century bloke's apartment. Unsurprisingly, modern archaeologists have quickly rejected this image of a kind of 19th century bachelor pad and have seen that very obviously as a projection of the 19th century writer's own world. In that process of familiarisation, they argue, Bulwer Lytton skates over a large number of inconvenient facts. The kitchen, for example, in the house of the tragic poet was tiny, like the majority of houses in Pompeii, could hardly have prepared a banquet. Nor does Bulwer Lytton remind the readers that the single latrine in the house was actually located in the kitchen. He says nothing whatsoever about the upstairs of the house, that there are stairs clearly leading to a first floor. And he's totally silent on the fact that just over the back wall of this nice garden was a cloth processing workshop or a fullery. Fulling was a messy business. Its main ingredient was human urine. The work was noisy and smelly. So in the background to Glaucus's elegant dinner party, modern archaeologists point out, there would have been a distinctly nasty smell. In place of that elegant vision uh, of kind of bachelor 19th century life, modern archaeologists have created a more reassuringly for us primitive version of what life was like in a house like this, something much more other. They argue for a much messier and much less differentiated space than Jell or Bulwer Lytton ever imagined. The 21st century version of the atrium of a Roman house, this one included, is not as elegant or spacious as the 19th century would have had it. For us, atriums are full of storage cupboards and they're chock-a-block with women weaving at looms. At night, the place is not the scene just of an upmarket dinner party. The modern archaeological vision of this house is of people bedding down all over the place, upstairs, on couches used for sitting during the day, or if you were a slave, on the floor. The latest estimate of the number of residents in this house puts it at over 40, um, perhaps up to 50. If there was a grand design to these houses, we now suggest, it was not actually in the delicacy of the living apartments and their accoutrements. It was in very broad line on the idea of vistas and viewing. The main line of sight, for example, from the front door through the atrium into the peristyle hits the tiny shrine at the back of the garden, as you can see here. And if you look into the front door here, you look right back through to the garden at the rear. Everybody is convinced now when they write about the Roman house that it was messy, undifferentiated, but in a certain sense open to display. You looked in from the outside into a recessive vista inside. You could do it on this house. You could do it in different forms on the famous house of the Vetii, where people have argued that there your line of sight goes through a vast priapic figure at the front door, past two money boxes to another priapic figure in the garden. But this is where the mistakes of the past, and so I want to finish, provide a useful prompt for us to reflect on the potential fragility of our own favourite interpretations. I think it's very useful to pause for a minute to ask how far 
or what, rather what, our own techniques of reconstruction of these buildings, of the environment of Pompeii, will look like to our successors 100 years later. Now, my hunch is that what we do in our reconstructive enterprises will end up seeming just as odd to people later as the 19th century versions of that do to us. My hunch, for example, is that our successors will be puzzled at the 21st century conviction that atria were packed full of women weaving and looms, and they will point out that the evidence for this doesn't extend beyond the finds of a few loom weights. They will also point out that although you could pack 30 people sleeping upstairs in this house, we have absolutely no idea whatsoever what happened up the stairs that do lead, as you can see, it's in one place, there's another stairs actually missed out over on the right. We have no idea what happens upstairs. And although there is an absolute modern fixation in the literature of the houses of Pompeii on the idea of through all this mess, nevertheless, there were a set of display lines uh, which took the vision of the house into, from the street, back into the inner sort of nucleus of the domestic property. I think that people in the future will be completely puzzled that that image of sight only works if you ignore absolutely every trace of the doors, hangings, curtains, shutters that blocked your vision from the front door to the back. It works only if you forget that Pompeians had wood and fabric. So I think there's, what I'm trying to say is, you know, in our reaction to Bulwer, Lytton and Co, we have projected a different but equally fragile version, equally um, ideologically loaded different version onto the Pompeian house. But just to finish finally, what about that market in the forum? Well, modern analysis of life in a Roman town stresses as fashions change different things. One of the things that late 20th and early 21st century scholars of Roman towns were interested in was the Roman religion in the Roman town, and in particular, the importance of the cult of the deified emperors of Rome in local municipal life. On the basis of that, both the buildings next to this market, or pantheon, are now firmly identified as buildings connected with the imperial cult. And bearing in mind the possibility of a statue of Augustus coming out of the market, the market is now generally deemed to be half a market, because that's the only way you can explain the fish scales. But it's now thought that one end of this, at one end of the courtyard, there must have been another area devoted to worship of the deified emperors. Indeed, one of the most recent studies to look again at this building has gone back, or really has rejected the market idea entirely, and has gone back to something which looks more, much more 19th century, and has deemed that the whole building was in fact a building of the cult of the deified emperors. Now, this not only raises the question of quite how obsessed we are, let alone the Romans, with this religious institution it makes pretty well half the buildings of the Roman Forum in some way concerned with the deified emperors. There is a kind of nice sense that we're going round full circle back to one version of at least Jell's understanding of this building, which was that it was, never mind the calf attached, it was a cult building of the cult of the Emperor Augustus. Uh, Who's right here, I think, is something one probably is never going to know. Thank you. If anyone would like to ask a question. Um, is it... Um, not possible that the um, religious function of the building could be completely coterminous with any other function and uh, either distanced 
in time or sure. just simply distance? I mean, it is, it is possible. Um, but the trouble is, I think, none of, the, none of the functional explanations, of which that would be one, are driven by anything more than a, a kind of version of what do we think it might be. And it is, it is not... I mean, it is, Roman commercial buildings um, do regularly have... They may have things on the wall that we call shrines, you know, just like a lorarium in a house. Um, the problem is that what you're getting here, I think, is a, you know, how far are you going to go to say that the Pompeian Forum was really a centre of uh, nationalistic loyalty cult? Now, that is something which modern scholars have found quite attractive because the imperial cults have been very much you know, on the TV recently. Um, I think my position is... How could we know? I mean, it could be any of these things. I mean, I'm pretty certain it isn't a cafe. I mean, Jell really did want it to be, he, he was very clever. He wanted to say, look, um, priesthood goes with eating. And he says, what do you need in a forum? You've got to have somewhere. He doesn't quite say to go and have a cup of coffee, but you've got to have somewhere where people go to eat. Uh, so you'll do it in, um, with the sacrificial meat in your little dining booths. Now, that probably is mad. All these other explanations, they're all of them, none of them, there's nothing inherently implausible about them. It's just a question of which one's right. Um, I mean, if you look at 19th century guidebooks to classical sites, um, they're extraordinarily, from our point of view now, very comic in the way in which they want to nominate very clearly what the rooms yes. are, what they're for. So, you, you know, you're full of sites, which obviously are actually very obscure, but they always say things like Queen's second bedroom. Yes, that's right. Um, I mean, uh, governor's wife's sitting room. That's yes. right. <coughs> and, and, but, but sometimes, as it were, as it, it's, it's not just a, a purely kind of a question of... Uh, historical scholarship, or rather it is, but at another level. Yeah. Um, th th there's a well-known, at least to architects, uh, essay by Robin Evans on, on rooms and corridors, which kind of show, as it were, that, you know, for example, in the 19th century uh, domestic architecture, uh, it's very clear that, in a sense, the very idea of the separation of rooms is that they have some rough and ready kind of function, and that's what the corridors are partly to do, and that's why they have one door, yeah. whatever. Uh, so, you know, it seems to me it's not just a dispute about what the room was, no. No, that's not true. but in some sense, uh, you know, that we have to think of the possibility of a completely different no, way right. in which a room functions, not, not just what have we got right, yes. what its actual no. function. I, mean, I think yes. that's exactly yes. what, is, what is prompted by this. I mean, I mean, you're absolutely right, but I think you're wrong to restrict it to the 19th century. If, yeah. you, pick up, if you pick up a modern guidebook or if you go around Pompeii and you listen to uh, the kind of sort of the nominal fallacy going on, now, sometimes we get around that apparently by giving these things Latin words. You know, you, you, take a you take a word out of Vitruvius and you call it a cubiculum and you somehow think that you've got over the problem of calling it Emperor's, you know, Emperor's second bedroom. But actually, you're doing just the same thing. But then it, it also, it seems to me, goes further than the guidebook, uh, because in some sense, it actually sort of provided an architectural ideology yeah. for conservation yeah. Uh, yeah. and restoration, yeah. so that, as it were, the rooms had to sort of to be restored in a way which began That's to mirror right. the 19th century's yeah, idea which is what, what happened in the, in the House of Tragic Poet. And what happened, I mean, you can go to another house, you could go to in Pompeii, where exactly the same has happened, but in a different form, is the House of Caecilius Eucundus. Now, I don't know how many people here have done the Cambridge Latin course, but uh, when, you know, in trying to revivify the study of Latin in schools 40 years ago, this new and now the standard Latin course in this country decided to set the beginning of it in Pompeii, and they have 
that they chose the house of the banker, Caecilius Eucundus. Not only do they give him a nuclear family, so there's Caecilius and Metella, husband and wife, um, a rather reprobate son who um, ends up in Britain, I think, and a couple of domestic retainers, but they then push a very 1960s version of room function onto these uh, rooms. And so you have Caecilius is sitting in his tablinum, and they say tablinum is like an office. So dad now is in his office because he's a banker but working from home. And so, uh, you know, I, I suppose what I'm saying is I'm looking at myself here because uh, if you were to get me to spout about what a Pompeian house would be, I certainly would spout. I would talk the talk about having a different version of what it is to, uh, uh, of what internal differentiation of space is all about. And yet also I'm aware precisely how modish that is. We're all talking about that. And the difficulty with Pompeii is that, and this is where the, the sense that it's, Actually, it isn't a kind of Marie Celeste in which everything is left as it was. We have very, very few finds that are clearly tied to rooms. So even if you wanted to know what happened in any particular space, either the guys had taken it with them before Vesuvius erupted, or the 19th century excavators uh, didn't record where they found anything. So in most of these big houses, you can't do what you'd think you could do which is say, right, okay, what was found in this room? Then we'll know how they used it. So you really are shooting in the dark. And I, mean, I, I suspect that the currently fashionable, well, let's really rethink the idea of how domestic space might be articulated within an entirely different culture line is going to look uh, weak at the knees a bit in 100 years' time. They're going to say, God, they're all going on about how it was all a bit sort of, you know, undifferentiated. And we'll be back because this is an, it's an empty space onto which we can project our sense of the Romans being like us, not like us, you know, half like us, sexist bastards. I mean, you know, you can come to this, and people have tried sometimes, very unsuccessfully in Rome, in fact, to say, look, okay, let's find the women's quarters. Right? Um, that's always been a very hard one to do. Uh, the, the architecture has resisted that. Let's find the slave quarters. Very hard to find. I mean, the only way you identify a place where slaves is in Pompeii is by the rather attractive, to my view, zebra stripe wallpaper, I mean, zebra stripe painting, um, which appears to decorate low status rooms. But that then becomes circular. They're now identified as low status rooms because they've got a zebra stripe pattern in them. Yeah, well, the answer to that is, in, in some senses, yes, but it depends where you draw the line. They would do that with bathing. You know, apart from very few houses, there is no bathing facilities in these houses. People are bathing commonly. It's not thought likely that servants were widely distributed through the town, because one of the puzzles of Pompeii is that, at least in space, total space terms, there, it is over-provided with... Uh, as a town with relatively spacious housing. And you know, unless you go back to a 19th century model which says, my goodness me, what a nice place Pompeii was. Everybody's living in these rather nice houses. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to be a poor. Well, that doesn't fit with our model of uh, the, the distribution of, of ancient wealth, honestly. So, what, um, the, re the way people now try and explain the lack of very much uh, non-wealthy housing is by saying that, in a sense, this is a complete dependency culture, and they were sleeping upstairs in these, uh, not necessarily the main occupants of the house, but upstairs were, uh, were rental uh, dependence properties, rental properties um, in small one rumours. 
because yeah, they were playing at it like you know, but Marie Antoinette and milkmaid. And <laughs> yes. Um, well, one line that I and some other people have speculated about is not 100% distant from that, although it's not quite the same. It is it's still going basically facing how can you how can you explain the population structure of this town when you haven't got enough, when you don't apparently have enough lower class housing. Uh, and some people would say they're shanty towns outside. That, that this is actually a town in which the, I mean, we, we've been, one's been to resorts where all the chambermaids you know, live someplace else. Well, it is possible that in Pompeii, the people are, uh, the real poor are living in shanty towns around the edge, out, outside the walls. There's, you could not show any evidence for that, but then evidence for it would be very hard to come by. Um, but it, it, it is a puzzle, and that's why people use up, you know, when <coughs> you've, you've got to, it seems to me that in all of these things, I mean, I looked at in, in specific cases, but they're just in a sense, I think, uh, uh, they're a template for the, for the bigger question. You have a big question, unanswered questions about how you fit a, an ancient population about its business onto these ruins. Um, and what you see is a variety of more or less desperate or more or less loaded attempts to answer that in order to make the picture fit. And what then happens is that those ways of making the picture fit sort of shift over time, and then they return to what to you know, the original moment, and we're back. You know, we're back with this being a temple of Augustus, like you know, in 1824 it would have seemed to be. And you can look at another case. Is look at there are a few, about 20, one apparently one-roomed properties in Pompeii. Um, go directly off the street. There's just a, a stone couch straight in. Some of them have got a phallus over the door. Now, uh, when in the sort of 70s, during the kind of high water mark of, you know, this town was full of brothels, those were all prostitutes' chambers. Yeah, that, so uh, at a certain point, there was something like, you know, on, on any estimate of Pompeian population, it's kind of like, you know, one prostitute per 12 guys, I think. Um, now, people are saying, the fact it's got a phallus over the door doesn't mean it's necessary. You know, here are we starting to see a place which we've got lower class housing, if you want. These are single, one room, off the street places that people lived. They're not parts of the sex industry. And the, 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 the fascination of it is there isn't enough material to know who's right. And so it is this wonderfully, it looks as if it purports to be, it sells itself as the place where you can unpeel, you know, you unpeel the lava, and my goodness me, there is the ancient world. In fact, you have the blank canvas all ready to be repainted by you know, successive, ex successive waves of speculation. Um, the, the, the idea of, um, of the use of the rooms uh, we've been discussing, um, it, I think one of the factors that differentiates the, life, the, the way of life that we sort of imp implied by the typology of the Roman house is that we very seldom realize the extent to which privacy, the, the, we, we understand the word privacy, uh, not only the differentiation of functions, but the actual differentiation of human beings in terms of separate human beings, separate egos in separate spaces, is entirely new. It's about 200 years old. And even in Europe in the 17th century, if you look at the plan of Versailles, there was no concept yes, of private life at all. Mm -hmm. And the, the life of the, of the house is, is a social life, mm -hmm. fundamentally a life for the family. And families in those days were extended families, so they had slaves, they had 
cousin, second cousin, third cousin. Well, it's, that's where the modern demographer would disagree with you. I mean, they would be, they would agree with you uh, in terms of thinking about the house as not being um, the private, the, the equivalent of a private modern dwelling. Yeah. That the house is, in a sense, much more shared space. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Vitruvius tells you that when he says, "How is this house differentiated?" And people translate him to say it's differentiated um, public and private. And he, what he actually says, it's differentiated between places where anybody can walk and people where, places where you can only go if you're invited. It's quite different from public and private. But modern demographers of the Roman family would, would say that just as the extended family within 17th and 18th century Britain was a construct, uh, a kind of slightly romantic construct of uh, 19th and 20th century historians, there is very little evidence for an extended family of that sort in any place in Rome. But what you do get evidence for is not an extended family so much, but a, a large number of disparate people with different connections one to each other, often not blood connections and often in some ways servile connections, still living in the same house. So if you say one of the things that the Romans That's do... That's what I call an extended family. Yeah, but they're not, it's not about having granny and a cousin. Actually, granny's dead. Uh, well, it is about that as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a totally different concept of life than what we have at the moment. I think that's, that's the thing that kind of... Roman know, demographers kind of would dispute that, but they would, they, they would end up in this roughly the same place that you've got. You've got what they call, they, they don't want to call it house extended family anymore. They, they like calling it housefuls. They don't have households in Rome. They have housefuls, um, which is an attempt to see a kind of version of what we would call multiple occupancy, but without the privacy. Yeah, right. It's interesting that in, in India, for instance, um, still in, in some of the uh, um, older houses with some of the sort of non-Westernized families, uh, and certainly houses in, in some places where you can actually visit, which I don't know how they, they're, they're not actually used uh, now, but certainly were uh, as little as 200 years ago. Um, they're very like a Roman house mm -hmm. in, in their typology. They're, they're based on the courtyard principle, mm -hmm. which is a big space in the middle, yeah. which with a, a lot of smaller rooms around yeah. the edge. Yeah. And the, the house, the circulation through the house is from, from one courtyard to another. Mm -hmm. And, so, and that, that kind of uh, special typology uh, fits very closely yeah. with a way of life yeah. that is, I would say, yeah. communal rather than yeah, private. I think, I think, I mean, although I'm going to disagree in, in, in the minor part, I think overall I think that must be right. Mm -hmm. Although I do think it's really striking um, if you go to Pom these Pompeian houses looking for signs of barriers rather than openness, you they find them all over the place. I mean, every, every doorway, no, it's not quite true, almost every doorway has some sign of the possibility of closure. And our version, when we reconstruct the Pompeian house, we forget, we always forget closure. Now, there are actually these rooms are tiny and pokey, um, and those doors can't always have been closed, I think. But it's, uh, it, uh, the, the utter openness model, which has, re has replaced the 19th century bachelor pad model, I think is, equally unsustainable by the evidence. A complete contrast would be certain Russian palaces that I visited. Uh, Zaskoy Selo, for instance, were uh, they're just huge rooms. And you can understand mm. how any kind mm. of social differentiation yeah, could go on there at all. But what seems to have happened is very simply that they had an army of servants and a lot of screens, yeah. and that differentiation was improvised and then dismantled again very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say, wh what, what's very striking here is this, the honeycomb of small, yeah. uh, the discrete cells, yeah. yes. which, which is a rather different pattern from yeah. simple openness. Yes, yeah. Um, it, it is interesting, and 
we also know, because of a Herculaneum preserves wood much better than Pompeii does, and there is one very splendid screen in Herculaneum, which is in an atrium, which is obviously being used to... Um, to, to for, I think not privacy, but for, for, as a barrier between one part of the house and another is a movable screen. I think the most interesting thing about the atrium is the, I mean, is the sense that it was the only part of the house, apart from the peristyle garden, but often these, peri apart from the biggest houses, the peristyle gardens are pretty tiny, actually. Um, they're pocket ham handkerchief gardens and the ambulatories are not big. Um, one of the, the arguments which has been used for saying that when you go into the atrium of a Roman house, you don't find what we now think of as kind of great open space, all terribly lovely. Um, uh, you find this is where all the work's going on. I mean, the current view would be, but it is only based on the odd loom weight here and there, is that you find an army of the girls doing the, um, um, doing the, the weaving, and actually you can't cook, you can't cook anything substantial in a Pompeian kitchen. Pompeian kitchens have just one hearth, and they're absolutely tiny. Um, so where are you cooking? Well, you're cooking actually, I mean, this is again the kind of diffusion of function. You must be cooking on braziers all over the place. So there must be portable cooking equipment. And you must also be eating. I mean, the, the problem is that the one room everybody thinks <coughs> they can identify is the dining room, the triclinium, because it's often got the places for the couches. So you think, okay, that's one place which is a firmly differentiated room. But it cannot possibly be the case that Pompeians regularly eat in their... In their you don't eat breakfast lying down. So you're actually using large... The only place where many people can function together is the atrium and peristyle. Um, there's some of the most interesting work and it's really been done by a man called Andrew Wallace Hadrill who's written quite a lot about the, the relationship between uh, a sort of Vitruvian pattern of the house being modelled on uh, zones of, of invitation not exclusivity but invitation and then how the wall painting is used <coughs> both to um, mark sight lines so that you look down o often the the back garden wall is in principle if we assume no barrier is visible from the front and often it has the biggest painting M very often these have suffered dreadfully but you get things like vast orpheuses uh, central on the back garden wall fantastic nilotic scenes um, which he then would relate to other kinds of hierarchized decoration, which is essentially to say um, the, the greater the perspectival vista that the room falsely gives you in its trompe l'oeil painting, the more important in that, the more important as a grand room it is. And that mythical scenes, which by, uh, very often have been cut out and um, put back in the, put in the museum in Naples so you can't now so easily reinsert them in um, their original context. Mythical m scenes of Greek myth, a central panel painting, marks out rooms of um, display. <coughs> and so he would divide the house into different axes of uh, en entry to anybody versus invitation and also... Um, Impre impression and non, you know, room to make impression and room not to make impression, and would see com conflicting axes, often mediated by styles and emphasis in painting, and sight line also. In the house of the Menander, <coughs> uh, one of the biggest and grandest houses in Pompeii, you look down to the painting that gave the house its name, the painting of Menander, right opposite the, the front entrance. I think this is still, you know, what worries me is that it still means that nothing is ever shut off. But that could be the case. Well, I mean, once you see it, you know it's not shut off. No, okay. No, that's true. <laughs> 
that's true. Um, there are also puzzling ones, I mean, much more puzzling sight lines <coughs> and apparent, I mean, <laughs> apparent relationships built between the, what you might reimagine as the course of people through the house and where the paintings are visible from. Uh, the difficulty about that as an argument is it tends to be circular. You know, this must have been where people sat because this is where you can see the painting from. But there, uh, there has been an attempt to think about painting as, as in a sense, a, a framing device for activity within the house as well as um, you know, wallpaper. Um, those pers perspectives, um, the, the wall painting you showed, the reconstruction of it, it's, it's so particular. Um, I mean, I thought of it when you talked about the recessive vistas, but is, are there ideas, does it give you ideas about the, whether they were different to, to see things like that or in that way? But, um, the the wall paintings of Pompeii, I think, have been uh, have suffered terribly by the dead hand of scholarship, <laughs> and there's, there's been a, a, a tremendous kind of gloomy, obsessive uh, attempt to uh, to date and classify these different forms of painting. In many ways, entirely missing the point. And what one of the things that happens in the leading aside the mythological figures, but the what you could say the bog standard wall painting is that it's all actually a, a, every bit of painting on the wall is in some ways much more strikingly than in within modern wall decoration uh, a rather upfront challenge to the, the sheer physicality of the wall um, every bit of painting is about saying what is this wall on which this painting is whether that is the or rather austere and probably early styles of painting which um, actually take rather cheap plaster stucco and paint and imitate marble blocks so they look like they really look like sides of temples um, to the more familiar Pompeian scenes which are these uh, playful recessive extravagant vistas where in a sense the whole fixity of what you're looking at within the house is being at least questioned. There's a game going on about the division of space. Now, quite how far you should intellectualise that, or how far it is legitimate to intellectualise that, um, uh, is not clear to me. But I mean, in some ways, what you've got is a, pa a clash between houses which, in some senses, are. Very, they're very inward looking, there's very few, apart from some very, very grand houses with sea views, which uh, never enter the literature because they've only relatively recently been excavated and they've not been published and no one really knows about them. Fantastic, multi-storey houses looking over the sea with great open spaces, open space windows, not glass, but terraces, fantastic sort of sea view properties. And those apart, the houses of Pompeii, are desperately inward looking in terms of plan. They don't have windows. You have to go up this narrow corridor to get into them. Um, the atrium looks spacious on a ground plan, but is chock full of all the bloody cupboards, honestly. We do know that there's cupboards around the atrium. The storage facilities are there. And the peristyle gardens are kind of small. Um, there's a few attempts, there's some quite imaginative attempts to bring light in, but they must have been very dark. Uh, that is then, in a sense, clashing with, uh, with even in relatively modest houses, um, a sense that the wall, the paintings on the wall are parading images that take you uh, vista-wise into um, sometimes foreign countries. You know, you've got, you're suddenly in Egypt in the back. Or alternatively, you've got this sense of perspective which is drawing you over, uh, over the painting, through the wall, over next door, uh, in, uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of trompe l'oeil version of outlook and view. 
qu I mean, how that is explained, I think, is is another question. Um, um, there's, you know, ev all Pompeian painting is very, very in your face, uh, illusionistic. Um, whether the how significant that is, I don't know. Could I just follow up on, in a sense, on that point? I mean, you uh, you mentioned the research. I think it was of Wallace Hadrog. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it also kind of touches on your own work in, in respect to spectatorship uh, within Roman kind of mm. history. Um, I, I suppose the question, in a sense, is that, you know, historians of pictorial representation kind of draw attention to the fact that the Romans didn't have centrally organized perspective. Mm. Uh, and I'm wondering to what extent you might think as a sort of material support of that in a sense, that it, partly that they didn't really have a notion of a static spectator. I think that's... And in some sense, the idea yeah. of a kind of ambulatory yeah. spectator yeah. Uh, would seem to be sort of quite consistent yeah. uh, with, uh, you know, yeah. with a non-centrally organized yeah. perspective, but one which had different centers, I uh, think that a perspectival right. organization. Yeah, I think that's right. And one of the... I mean, one of the puzzles, and you always have to say with Pompeii, you know, you know uh, we get a very misleading picture of the kind of furniture that there was around. But these aren't, there aren't places to sit. You know, these, are, these are houses in which you feel that people are on the move. Right? So there are very, very few benches. Um, or, I mean, there are some chairs surviving, but, but you know, we, we, a, l a lot of chairs need metal. You know, to make, you know, at least in bits. Um, and very, very little of that survives. You, th you think of this is a world in which people are on their feet a lot, I think, and people are moving and the houses are, uh, are, are a sense of, uh, are in motion. And I think that's right. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, I think the, the kind of, the idea of the, um, the way the wall painting can fit into that, the sort of challenge to, s to the, s the idea of the static viewer uh, is important. Mary, I just wanted to say thanks Pleasure. for a terrific lecture. Um, and then to add that um, if we manage to keep it going, um, a version of this lecture will appear